Hey everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thank you as always for joining us. Uh, a historic update because of the terrible straits our country are in as a result of the malicious prosecution of President Trump. I'll bring you up to date on that. Plus a new federal lawsuit by Judicial Watch to uncover the Biden censorship collusion with big tech. Plus we have information about another Biden White House dog out of control and seemingly biting everybody. I've got uh, news to share with you on that. First up, of course, is the outrageous attack on a Republican form of government by Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, who, uh, for the first time in American history, uh, indicted a former president of the United States, obviously President Trump. And uh, it's an unprecedented act. It was an abusive act. It was a malicious act. It was a political act. It was election interfering act. And it was a wild act of abuse of power, a sensitive power that all prosecutors have uh, when it comes to deciding whether to prosecute someone. And uh, the president was a political prisoner. He was taken into custody uh, based on bad faith charges that had no basis in law, uh, no basis in fact. So it's not a question of his doing something wrong and he shouldn't be prosecuted. No, he did nothing wrong. He settled a case. He settled a dispute. Arguably, he was the target of an extortion operation by Stormy Daniels. And they're trying to cram all that in to felony charges. Now, you know, many others have spoken about the uh, lack of specificity in the charges, uh, just how weak the case is, uh, the case is uh, which further highlights the political nature of it. If you can't explain something legally as being justified, then what's the explanation? Well, when something stupid or wrong usually happens in cases like this, it's not because the law is bad or the facts are bad or you know, the, the sort of legal analysis you would bring to bear. It's because politics are guiding the decision-making by Alvin Bragg. And of course, he's a Soros-backed prosecutor. Uh, I know that uh, line has been bandied around a bit, uh, but I want to explain it further. Soros was a key supporter of his campaign through this other group, uh, a substantial portion of the monies he spent on his campaign or had spent on his behalf was as a result of Soros's intervention. And you know Soros is an extremist, and he supports, generally speaking, extremist candidates. And in the case of district attorneys like Bragg, these extremist candidates uh, see their role as not enforcing the rule of law, prosecuting criminals, but using the tools of the prosecutor, prosecutor's office for political purposes, and whether it be letting criminals out or in the case of Trump, targeting people based on politics and turning them into, as I said, uh, political prisoners. And, and yes, I mean, I mean it when I say political prisoner. I had, um, or Judicial Watch had, uh, PolitiFact, which is one of these left-wing, uh, dishonest fact-checking organizations that harass groups like Judicial Watch and conservatives in order to get them censored, uh, suggests that when I said that he was a political prisoner, I should have to back it up, and that's not factually accurate. And I, you know, we sent back, you know, your, your question's absurd. Of course he's a political prisoner. And the idea you're gonna fact check an opinion like that is, is just beyond belief. Uh, but that shows you where the left is at. I mean, you call them out on the truth and they quote, wanna fact check you? Does anyone seriously, seriously dispute that President Trump is being prosecuted because of his politics versus anything he did wrong? And of course, you know, just to bring you back to the underlying indictment, uh, another indication of the abuse is he's charged with 34 felonies, right? And by now, you've probably heard it explained multiple times that uh, the alleged issue of falsifying business records, which are um, typically misdemeanors, have been kind of uh, uh, turned into felonies under his theory or um, Bragg's theory of the case because they were in an effort to commit another crime, namely campaign finance crimes of some type. But in the indictment, he doesn't list what those other crimes are about. So they've arrested the former president of the United States, current leading candidate for president of the United States, or at least tied with Biden in the polls, more or less. 
and they're not telling him what the crime is. And Bragg's excuse afterwards is, well, we're not required to put that into the pleadings and we'll bring out all the evidence during trial. That's your Stalinist approach to prosecuting Trump. You're going to get arrested. We're not going to tell you what the crimes are and we're going to tell you what the evidence is during trial. I tell you, if justice is being served, Mr. Bragg will be removed as a district attorney for abuse of office and disbarred. But we know how justice is going to go. It's New York City. It's a left-leaning jurisdiction. The whole political class in there is anti-Trump. Uh, the judge himself, uh, he made modest contributions. I think the reports are $35. But it was $35 to Democrats and uh, at least Democrat political organizations, campaigns, candidates, et cetera, and at least one small contribution to Biden. And my understanding of the ethics rules is that judges aren't supposed to be making political contributions of any size to candidates or political organizations. So, you know, we know how it's going to go in New York. Now, we can hope good sense prevails, wisdom and discernment prevail, justice prevails, but we know how it's going to go. And uh, we also, I think, can guess how it's going to go in Fulton County, Georgia, where another left-wing prosecutor is concocting crimes to charge Trump with. Or in here in Washington, D.C., where you have uh, the Biden um, uh, Justice Department, uh, who just hired a, a, a special counsel to investigate Trump on January 6th and this document hoax that they're pursuing. So you have three sets of politicized prosecutors in Georgia, D.C., and in New York, all thinking of ways to make Trump a political prisoner. They took an aggressive step forward with the Bragg um, indictment. And now Trump you know, has this sort of Damocles over his head. It's already election interference because everything he says can and will be used against him in a court of law. The judge has essentially warned him if he says anything too aggressive, uh, you know, he's subject to court sanction or restrictions. So already the campaign has been distorted as a result of Bragg's election interference. And this is what I, this is what I issued. This is the statement I issued on Judicial Watch's behalf in uh, earlier this week when we had that horrible day of uh, Trump being indicted. What a sad day for America. And what a blow to the rule of law and our Republican form of government. Today, President Trump and the American people were abused and victimized by New York Democrat politician Alvin Bragg, who abused his office to try to jail a man he must know to be innocent. This is an indictment about nothing based on non-crimes and politics. It's a rigged prosecution to rig an election. The court must end this malicious prosecution before the nation is irreparably damaged. In the meantime, Congress must immediately investigate Bragg's election interference and his political attack on Trump's civil rights. And Judicial Watch, of course, has already launched a series of Freedom of Information Act requests and open records inquiries into this unprecedented attack on the American way. And I say this, Every politician of note should be denouncing this. Every Republican, every conservative, every activist along the right or Republican uh, areas should be concerned about their personal liberty. Every dissident liberal should be concerned about their personal liberty. I mean, this, this is a dangerous escalation in the war on the rule of law and, as I say, our Republican form of government. And by Republican form of government, I mean We've got rules, we have laws in place, right? And are we going to be a nation of laws or a nation of men where politicians target their enemies and abuse the powers of law entrusted to them by the American people and um, entrusted to them under the oath they took to try to jail their political enemies? And you know, it's all part of a piece because it seems like things are kind of spiraling out of control, doesn't it? I mean, you see in Tennessee where you had these leftists engage in this violent intimidation insurrection against the Tennessee state legislature for whatever reason. I, I think they were using, um, uh, they wanted to eliminate Second and Fourteenth Amendment rights related to gun ownership 
in Tennessee, and the legislature is conservative, and so they thought the way to deal with that was to try to uh, wreck the legislature, including having members of the legislature participate in that wrecking operation. And at least two members, I think, were, were expelled as a result, and then you have the entire left justify that. Shows you that their whole concern about January 6th is largely a lie, doesn't it? The left embraces political violence, intimidation, and insurrection. And then you have this transgender extremist violent contagion escalating across America. You have this terrible shooting, um, you know, not too long ago, uh, again in Tennessee, of, uh, resulted in three babies, three nine-year-olds being killed and three uh, innocent adults. Uh, a 61-year-old janitor, the head of the school, and some poor substitute teacher by a transgender extremist. Another transgender extremist was just caught planning a massacre. And I saw the news today that, you know, someone who's trying to speak truth about this transgender extremism, you know, nearly lost her life as, at the hands of transgender and violent leftist ext extremists. Riley Gaines, a, a, um, a former a swimmer athlete, college athlete. And, and, and the left is, is, is raising these people up. I mean, this murderer in Nashville is, is being treated as a heroine by the radical left. So they're embracing this violence, embracing this um, escalation of pressure, what I would say insurrection on legislators and they're trying to jail their political opponents by abusing the powers entrusted to them. It's, it's a pretty dark period for America, don't you think? And Judicial Watch is going to stand strong against this. Uh, we are exposing all of this wherever we can, promoting and educating people about the rule of law, and uh, blowing the whistle on the corruption, whether it be the corruption in the targeting of Trump, uh, the uh, dangerous left-wing radical extremism at work across the nation, exposing it, whether it be in our military, in our government, or in our schools. And you know, part of this is the racialism inherent in the critical race theory, again, a cousin of the transgender extremism. I mean, just this week, you had the Biden administration and I think this transgender extremism is, is particularly dangerous because they're targeting children. I mean, all these fighting about kids, transgender athletes, this is about placing children in situations where a sexual identity is made an issue, right? So it's always about the sexualization of children. Don't be distracted by, about athletics. It's about privacy and the sexualization of children and attacks on women and frankly attacks on men, attacks on children and frankly all of humanity. And the Biden administration is endorsing this, this agenda, this extremism in the military, using tax dollars to uh, 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 promote these mutilating surgeries and the Biden administration has made it clear that they support this transgender extremism for children. They've issued new regulations they want to put in place uh, that put, put schools on the block if uh, they deny access of men to women's sports. I mean, and, you know, and it, who gets victimized? These, <laughs> frankly, in my view, these poor, these poor folks who, who say they're transgendered because they're being used and taking advantage of, you know, by our culture, by our media. Well, you see this uh, Bud Light promoting this very disturbed person, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, um, who, you know, says he's transgendered, says he is pretending to be a woman. Uh, a lot of his rhetoric and his whole demeanor, which is really a parody and misogynistic, is geared at children. Uh, so this is quite ugly. You've got Bud Light, and then Nike has him running around, um, again, mocking women. Uh, so, I mean, everyone's kind of being victimized by this transgender extremism. You know, we were talking about, I was on the Tim Pool show this week, 
And Matt Walsh, who's been taking the lead here in kind of confronting this, the, the insanity of this transgender extremism, you know, was talking to a man who said that he was a woman, he was transgendered. And, you know, he said something like, you know, you look like a man. And everyone was outraged about it. And I think, you know, I mean, if you look at this person, I mean, I'd be hesitant to confront him. I mean, you know, he had four arms, <laughs> he had four arms the size of me. He's walking around saying, everyone's telling me I look like a woman. He doesn't. So we're, everyone's being required to engage in this big lie. And it's dangerous because it leads to this crisis for some of these folks. And of course, because they're extremists and because they're fundamentally communist in approach, they want to destroy, right? And so what they say is their opponents, when they dispute these policies, when they dispute their efforts to mutilate children, are, quote, uh, using words that are, quote, violent. So when you say your opponents are violent simply because they disagree with you, that justifies the worst against them, doesn't it? If Christianity is violent for espousing Christian principles, if an American is violent for suggesting that men shouldn't be involved in women's sports, then all bets are off, right, when it comes to targeting them. So I kind of digress a little bit because th this is like the fever of the moment, right? This transgenderism. And I, and I think this kind of fanaticism, this crazed anything goes, it results in also, it has all different types of symptoms. This transgenderism, uh, this, um, this woke culture with the critical race theory, and, and the effort, frankly, to jail all your political opponents like Donald Trump. Now what next? to get back to the Trump issue. What next for Trump? I don't know. I mean, I think he's gonna be indicted by all of these leftists in all these jurisdictions. And uh, so I don't know what's gonna happen. I, th I say we're an undiscovered country. And I, I made a comment to the Washington Post um, over the last few days, it was uh, over the last weekend, that got picked up in the media and I said all bets are off because you can bet a local district attorneys in conservative jurisdictions like Texas and Florida are going to be trying to find a hook, for instance, into the Biden family so they can prosecute them. And unlike Trump, there's plenty of evidence the Biden family has been involved in substantial criminal activity, so the hook may be substantial. So is that where we're going to be? I don't know. And in this case, the pres President Trump submitted himself to the jurisdiction of the court in New York. Well, that isn't always going to be the case. So we could have rule of law crises as a result of these uh, political prosecutions in the future. Some people may object in ways that, you know, create a crisis. So what's the way out? Well, there's got to be consequences for this misconduct, right? And there has to be consequences under law. And all the tools available to anyone of authority in our nation's public life should be used. And the president, if he had any principles, uh, would shut down the Justice Department harassment of his uh, competitor for the presidency. And he'd ask the Justice Department to see what's going on with Bragg. The governor of, of New York, again, should pardon or commute or shut down Bragg's operation. Congress can shut all of this down by defunding New York in a multiple ways. You hear about this debt limit fight and Republicans trying to get certain policies and cuts in, in under this uh, debt limit fight. Well, why wouldn't this be part of it? Similarly, cut off the Justice Department's abuse of citizens who support Trump or are perceived to be on the wrong side of the political aisle. Same goes to Fulton, Fulton County, Georgia. So when, when people say nothing can be done, either they're not being, thinking it through enough or they're just trying to keep you quiet. And I'm telling you something can be done under the law to stop this abuse of Trump and other innocent Americans. 
And so Judicial Watch is going to do what it can. We've got the several investigations already underway onto all of these issues I've been talking about. And we've been um, forthright and speaking truth to power about holding Biden accountable, for instance, holding, you know, is Hillary now going to be subject to prosecution? What about Obama? Why not? New rules, right? New rules. I tell you what, if you're going to indict Trump on non-crimes, then let's think about indicting Obama, Hillary, Schiff, Bill, Biden, Pelosi, you name it, on the real crimes that they've been credibly accused of. But there's got to be consequences. There's got to be an understanding that you cannot cross this line without a reaction from those who want to protect and promote the rule of law, our Constitution, and truth, justice, and the American way. So I'm glad it's been a few days since the indictment, so I'm not as angry as I otherwise would have been. But I don't, I, I would, anger wasn't the right word. It's, you know, because, you know, it's outrageous, obviously. It's sadness. Because think about President Trump personally. He didn't do anything wrong. And he's being dragged through the mud and having his liberty put at risk simply because of his politics. He's been terribly abused. His civil rights have been abused. And I said it once and I'll say it again because it's the ultimate truth here. President Trump is a crime victim. And now Alvin Bragg is one of the perps abusing him. So uh, obviously we'll be on top of this and you know, come back here often to see uh, what we have to say on the current events and obviously we'll be uh, advising you of our investigations as they proceed. Speaking of abuses, one of the biggest abuses of our time is the uh, use of the Justice Department, the Department of Homeland Security, the CIA, the State Department, the Defense Department, the White House to collude with big tech to censor you. So Americans have been victimized by the millions by this collusion of censorship, this, uh, someone said this big censorship, um, what is it, the censorship industrial complex to target American citizens. And the censorship obviously most uh, directly impacted the 2020 election in the sense that it was designed to influence the 2020 election by, with, by censoring information about Hunter Biden and by suppressing uh, the other candidate President Trump. And then you had the censorship related to COVID, the vaccines, COVID origin. You have the censorship ongoing related to election integrity and the disputes about elections. It's still happening. If I say the wrong thing here on YouTube, they'll take the damn video down. Pardon my language. So it's ongoing. And it's with the endorsement and support and pressure from the Biden administration. And Judicial Watch has been front and center in exposing and investigating this. Now, we've heard about the Twitter files where Elon Musk has allowed reporters to look at internal Twitter documents documenting some of this collusion with the federal government that not only show collusion with the feds and some state officials, but also that the collusion includes Facebook and, and, and Google and these other social media platforms. And Judicial Watch uh, has been trying to get the other side of the Twitter files by suing in federal court to say, well, you know, Twitter says you've been telling them to censor. I want your documents showing that you were telling Twitter and others to censor. And so accordingly, we've been suing. And most recently, we sued the Homeland Security Department, Department of Homeland Security, for records on their censorship meetings with big tech. And there's a specific agency that was created, unfortunately, during the Trump administration in response to the Russia hoax. That tells you how, how poorly um, based it was. 
uh, called the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency. So it was originally designed to stop the Russians and foreign, foreigners from, quote, interfering in our elections, a relatively speaking, a non-problem, unless, of course, you're talking about the Chinese paying off the Bidens. Instead, it transmogrified into um, a censorship board that went after anyone who said anything they didn't like about the election disputes at the time. And we've asked for documents about what it was up to, and we've been getting the runaround, an unlawful, unlawful response, unlawful secrecy to our request. We asked for records and communications of its director, its former director, its former senior cybersecurity advisor, and it's, um, I guess, another senior cybersecurity advisor. So this is the top leadership regarding the following topics. The CISA has facilitated and hosted U.S. government industry meetings with Facebook, Meta, Twitter, Wikimedia Foundation, Pinterest, LinkedIn, concerning election security. Uh, election infrastructure subsector government coordination council meetings. Boy, to describe it is to condemn it, isn't it? Election infrastructure subcontractor government coordinating council joint MDM working group meetings and preparatory meetings with any employees of the DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis, the FBI, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, the National Security Agency, the Secret Service concerning any of the aforementioned meetings or council meetings. So we know that CISA has been working with both inside government agencies and outside groups to censor countless Americans. And the Twitter threads, the Twitter file threads, which we uh, detail in our press release, uh, really expose this. A December 16th tweet thread includes um, disclosures in the Twitter files that reports also came from different agencies. And they reference a, um, an employee recommending bouncing content, this is a Twitter employee, based on evidence from DHS, et cetera. And you can bet that was the CISA agency. And then uh, you had this FBI agent, Elvis Chan, who was doing all sorts of censorship activity for the FBI out of the San Francisco office, talking about a foreign influence task force, which obviously would have included DHS. Another tweet thread, uh, again, Twitter files thread, shows that Twitter was, quote, more like a partner to government. With other tech firms, meeting like Facebook and Google, it held a regular industry meeting with FBI and DHS and developed a formal system for receiving thousands of content reports from every corner of government. Emails from FBI, DHS, and other agencies often came with spreadsheets of hundreds or thousands of account names for review. Often, these would be deleted soon after. So uh, maybe the documents are still over in the government. The same agencies, including DHS and the CISA organization, invites the same, quote, experts, left-wing censorship promoters, funded by the same foundations, left-wingers, trailed by the same reporters, leftists who want um, uh, people they don't like censored, uh, they were all involved in kind of generating this, as I said, the censorship industrial complex. So in addition to the Twitter files, there was this lawsuit in, um, uh, led by the states of Missouri and Louisiana that exposed a lot more of this censorship operation out of the government. And it includes, related to the Department of Homeland Security, not only this, sort of this first of all, there's a lot of FBI censorship here, but DHS was in the middle of it. The lawsuit also produced um, DHS agency meeting minutes that discuss its attempts to manage information being posted by social media contributors. I mean, the government can't be managing your, quote, information or your social media posts, but that's what they're doing. So we've got detail after detail showing that DHS was in the middle of this massive effort that's, in my view, is ongoing it's not a question of that being my view. The Biden administration is, is committed to it, and they've been promoting it, and aren't embarrassed about it. Uh, this censorship operation run out of the Department of Homeland Security, 
which as I recall, and you should recall, was created to protect the homeland from terrorists, right? And to protect us from having planes thrown into buildings. Now it's being used to censor us for criticizing the way Biden got elected. Or raising a question about a vaccine or COVID lockdowns. I mean, it's insanity and it's gotta stop. And as I said earlier, there's this urgency here. Judicial Watch obviously is suing, but where's Congress? None of this happens without tax dollars. Congress should shut it all down immediately because right now Americans are being victimized. We can't wait two years. In Judicial Watch, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This lawsuit, we just sued the FTC over its um, abuse of Donald, excuse me, its abuse of, not Donald Trump, Freudian slip, Elon Musk. Again, all part of the same piece, right? They go after their opponents. They try to jail their opponents. They harass their opponents. Musk is an opponent of the deep state, of the left, of the democratic agenda to censor Americans and Trump supporters and whatever. So she's being targeted by the Biden administration through the FTC. We've sued the FTC over this targeting. We've sued, for instance, California over its targeting of Judicial Watch. The Secretary of State's office caused YouTube to take down a video featuring yours truly telling the truth about election integrity issues. I mean, we've exposed document after document showing this censorship. And we're not going to stop. Because if our First Amendment ends, our republic ends. So as I said earlier, stay tuned, come back, and we'll give you more as events warrant on this censorship crisis. You know, one thing I've learned about the Biden administration is there's no topic that is too petty for them to mislead, withhold information, or lie about. Uh, I guess in most directly, we had the news this week uh, leaked to the media that the uh, Biden administration was lying about the Chinese spycraft attack on the United States a few weeks ago, um, where a Chinese spycraft, you know, had that balloon uh, spying on us floating over the United States for days on end. And, you know, the Biden people were saying, oh, it's no big deal. We've taken steps to curtail their ability to collect data. They won't be able to send it back to China, et cetera, et cetera. All that was a lie. I mean, all of that was disinformation, misinformation, falsehoods, misleading, you name it. They were collecting data in real time. We couldn't stop it. They were over our military installations doing figures eight, figure eights above the military installations so they could spend more time there. Can you imagine a commander in chief allowing a, United, a, a Chinese spy craft over US territory to perform figure eights above our sensitive military installations without an aggressive response? Well, it happened. And of course, we only found out about it after he was forced to shoot it down, after it left US territory, at least was over, over, over water. Unbelievable. You know, and then there's the small stuff. Of course, if you're bitten by the dog, it ain't small of the Biden White House misleading and withholding information about Biden's dogs biting. Judicial Watch had last year exposed how the White House had been lying about their dogs, specifically Major, uh, basically biting everybody. I'm, I'm exaggerating for a little effect, but not really. I mean, he was out of control. He was biting Secret Service agents, staff, et cetera, and they were covering it up and the agents were injured. Uh, the dogs had to be removed because they were so out of control. And uh, the White House spokeswoman was asked about it, Jennifer Sackey, and she said, that, well, there was one bite and um, it was an agent who startled the dog. But that wasn't what happened. The dog, uh, the, the guy was standing in a room and the dog walked into the room with, with who he was, she was either being handled, the major was either being handled by the president, I think, or, or Jill Biden. And the dog just <laughs> rocketed across the room 
and attack the agent. Now, anyone who's a dog owner is sympathetic to <laughs> being in a situation where your dog bites someone. But you don't lie about it. And you don't pretend it's a, not a big deal, especially if there are multiple bites going on. So long story short, they had to get rid of poor Major. I don't know where he is. I think they rehomed him. And they got another dog, Commander. Well, Judicial Watch got a tip. Commander is out of control too. So we asked the Secret Service for records. And um, according to, um, I guess we got the tip at the end of last year. So we did the FOIA in the end of December. And then on January 20th, this is what we asked for. Any records related to incidents of aggression and bites involving the Biden family dog, Commander, including communications between the Secret Service officials and the uniformed and non-uniformed divisions involved in the White House operations and the Presidential Protection Division. So, I, you know, my understanding when they say uniformed and non-uniformed, the non-uniformed are the Secret Service agents here you're used to seeing around the president, the, you know, the big guys, the women who are standing there guarding the, the, uh, the president. But mo the bulk of the Secret Service are the uniform division who are uniformed officers, uh, law enforcement officers who provide protection uh, you know, to the White House and its environs. Um, now the Secret Service, interestingly, acknowledged receipt of our request on January 20th. Um, they said they found responsive records, okay? So there are records that are responsive to our request to the incidents of aggression and bites. Okay, so think about how that reads. It means, yes, there were reports. And they said they're processing them. Well, guess what? We still haven't gotten the records. It's two months later almost, we still haven't gotten the records. So they're covering it up, and we've had to sue for it. So we've had essentially confirmation of our tip, the commander's out of control, and they're covering it up. And you know, when you look at the documents uh, where the Secret Service agents are really angry and upset and nervous about the dog, at least Major, you, know, you don't want to be on the wrong end of a dog attack, ever. Even if the dog comes at you and there's nothing that happens, do you want to be around that dog the next day? I mean, these Secret Service agents have a tough enough job. They're willing to put their lives on the line, but they shouldn't be facing the prospect of dog bite injuries because the Biden family doesn't give a crap. That's what it comes down to. They don't care. Reportedly, Biden said he didn't believe the dog attack stories or something about or the severity of it early on, you know, the other, for the other dog. I mean, he, he doesn't care about this, it's clear. I mean, it's his dog. I mean, let's, let's get personal to Biden here. This isn't a Biden administration policy. This isn't the Department of Homeland Security or the deep state or the FBI. This is Joe and Jill's dog that are biting White House Secret Service agents, government officials, you name it. And they're covering it up. What sort of people do that? I'd like to know. And of course, it's Judicial Watch, who's once again doing the heavy lifting on this. And I'm sure the media will mock this, but they don't care because, you know, it's not they, they're not the ones getting bitten. Who cares about the Secret Service agents? They don't care about them. It's all about protecting the Biden political operation. But Judicial Watch isn't going to be cowed. We're going to push back. We're going to get all of these records. We're going to expose, and as we already have previously, that the Biden family cares more about protecting whatever it is they want for their dogs than the safety and security of Secret Service agents that are putting their lives on the line for them. So, a lot to be outraged, huh? A lot to be outraged about. Get Trump being accused of fake crimes, being turned into a political prisoner, man censorship of Americans, 
And the Biden administration and the Biden, Joe Biden is so personally corrupt, he doesn't care if dogs are biting agents around him. This terrible time. So, well, with that, it is Easter. I guess it's still Passover as well. So I wish you um, not only a happy Passover if you're celebrating it, uh, but I wish you all the joy and the peace of Easter. Uh, it is the holiday of holidays uh, for those of us who are Christian. And I just wish you the blessings that come with that day. And I hope that stays with you throughout the entire year. And I share uh, those best wishes on behalf of not only me and mine, uh, but our entire staff here at Judicial Watch. I'll see you here next time on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.